Hello and welcome to the episode 239 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today, we will narrate the events of a very fateful day. The starting of the filming of a documentary on the Mercy Beat, the Beatles meeting Elvis Presley, and the death of Brian Epstein are the three main stories of the show. But let's start with the 1960 residency at the Indra Club in Hamburg, West Germany. The Beatles, featuring Pete Best on drums and Stu Sutcliffe on bass, duly performed another six hours during the evening. One year later, in 1961, the Beatles, now with Paul McCartney on bass, performed at the Casbah Coffee Club in Liverpool. In 1963, the lads, now with their final lineup with Ringo Starr on drums, were busy throughout the day with the filming of the BBC documentary on the Mercy Beat phenomenon, as agreed by their manager Brian Epstein. See episode 218 for more info on that. Starting at 9.30 am, director Don Howard had them performing in the empty Little Theatre in Southport. Appreciating the difficulties that he would incur if he was to record an actual live performance, Howard decided to use the footage of the band performing in an empty theatre mixed with the footage from a real concert, specifically the 26th of August engagement at the Odeon Cinema, as detailed in yesterday's episode. The band performed Twist and Shout and She Loves You dressed in the colorless grey suits they used every night, and Love Me Do, whose sound would be later replaced with the EMI single, wearing black suits with a different background, to give the idea of a separate shooting occasion. At night, the Fabs performed the second of six nights at the Odeon Cinema in Southport. 1964, the 23rd of August Hollywood Bowl performance of the Beatles, detailed in episode 235 of What A Fab Day, was mixed in stereo today by producer Boyle Gilmer and engineer Hugh Davis at an unknown location. Later in the day, at the Cincinnati Gardens in Cincinnati, Ohio, the Beatles performed another one-show concert of their tour in front of 14,000 people. Before the concert, the Fabs talked with Elvis Presley on the phone and held a press conference. After the end of the performance, instead, they took a flight to New York City, New York, where they landed at 2.55 pm, welcomed by some 2,000 fans. One year later, in 1965, an historical meeting took place when, in the late evening, the Beatles were driven to Perugia Way, Beverly Hills, to meet Elvis Presley. The biggest star of the old American rock and roll met the biggest acts of the new British rock. The meeting, arranged by Presley's manager, Colonel Parker, was highly anticipated by the band and Brian Epstein alike. While the Fabs and the King had managed to speak on the phone during the first Beatles North American tour in 1964, they had never met in person. No press was invited, no pictures and no recording of the event in any form was to be taken. In fact, the whole affair was a bit anticlimactic. Elvis was not nearly as eager to meet these four youngsters from Liverpool as they were to meet him. He didn't even get up from his sofa when they met in his TV room. This is not to say that Elvis didn't respect them, he was just playing cool and making sure that they understood that he was still to be treated like the king. For their part, it seems the Beatles were too overwhelmed, and perhaps too high on pot, to even ask questions for a while. After a good 30 minutes, Elvis decided to pick up his bass and lead an impromptu jam session. Despite the known agreement, a tape of this session has been long rumored to exist, but it has never materialized. When Elvis felt it was time to retire, the meeting broke up. Allegedly, the Beatles invited Elvis to join them at their Hollywood house the night afterwards. 
a bit strange given their show in San Diego. Anyhow, they never met again. In the late evening of Sunday, the 27th of August 1967, Brian Epstein's corpse was found in his Chapel Street house in London. He was 32 years old. Lately, he had become more and more subject to violent mood swings. He was concerned about the end of his contract with the Beatles, due to expire on the 1st of October, as he was afraid the Fabs would have not renewed it. Homosexual in a country that still regarded homosexuality as a criminal offence, addicted to both legal and illegal drugs and gambling, Brian had lived miserably for some months when he died. Brian probably drowsed into death after taking six carbital tablets, a sleeping pill he normally took to fight the insomnia resulting from his amphetamine abuse. While the dose might have been normal for him, he had also taken a significant amount of alcohol with the pills, which lowered his resistance. The fact that he was attending to his correspondence when he died and that no death note was found made the coroner rule out suicide. The overdose had been accidental. This was no cover-up. Peter Brown testified that on the phone, Epstein had told him that in due course, after eating something, reading his mail, and watching Jukebox Jury, he would have called again to make plans to join him in Epstein's house in Sussex. The Beatles learned about Brian's death while in Wales to study transcendental meditation with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. They received comfort from the Maharishi and decided not to attend Epstein's funeral, to give the family some privacy and to avoid turning the event into a media circus. The band was deeply affected by the loss. They had trusted Epstein like no one else, and while they might have been dissatisfied with some aspects of his management, including glaring mistakes in handling merchandising earnings, or needed less from him with the end of their touring, one could speculate that they would have renewed his management contract. Even when, after Brian's death, the band found that he wasn't quite as honest to us as he made out, as Lennon put it, they knew Epstein had been instrumental in their success and that whatever mistake he had made was probably due to his own inexperience. He had to grow quickly managing them, and he had tried his best and made a lot of good decisions too, but in the end, as McCartney put it, he looked to his dad for business advice and his dad knew how to run a furniture store in Liverpool. In his infamously nasty 1970 post-breakup interview with Rolling Stones, John Lennon commented that Epstein's death marked the beginning of the end for the group. I knew we were in trouble then, I thought, we fucking had it now. As I explained in episode 100, this might not be THE event leading to the final breakup, but there is little doubt that it was one of the main pieces of that puzzle. I know this is not the best moment to do this, but I have to break the gloom to allow the episode to end more peacefully. If you want to support me in my effort to offer to our little community more music-rated content of the highest quality I can, you know the drill. Visit www.simonmas.com support and do what you can or feel like doing. Thank you! Let's close the episode with some work on the White Album completed on this date in 1968. George, John and Paul oversaw the cleaning up of the recorded material for the album in Abbey Road, with balance engineer Ken Scott preparing a final copy of Obladi oh Oblada, oh Blackbird and Not Guilty in mono, and of Revolution 9 in stereo. The work was concluded between 4.30 and 5.00 pm. This lengthy episode is over. 
lots of momentous events today, but tomorrow's show won't be any less exciting. Join me if you fancy. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.